How will you do it, Astrid? Look at the many before you who have perished away. Give up. A death in your bunker is less painful than the one that awaits you above the surface. You will join the mess of human flesh and bones with which they build their own bodies. If you stand against them, you will meet a fate similar to those who resisted before you. Astrid opened her eyes. The smell of medicine and freeze-dry food wafted through the air as she lay in her bunk bed, mind flitting from one voice to another, her body preparing itself for what would be doomsday. Twenty-five years of her life had been spent listening to the voices inside her head. Right from the day she'd been born, into this biohazardous planet today. Yet, this week, they'd gotten awfully loud and comprehensible, unlike before, when they were just a jamble of jittery whispers that made no sense, except to warn Astrid every time of impending danger, saving her life countlessly. While she was one of the finest soldiers on the Twelfth Legion, the impending extraterrestrial doom that was to come tomorrow will take away that prestige from her too. The voices in her head had left no stone unturned to stop her from fighting what was to come in the morning. Deep in a corner of her mind, a bittersweet thought often formed. What would her life have been like? she had lived and died before day zero. A fateful day, when life on Earth as humans knew it, changed forever. You know they're dead, right? Mag said from her bunker bed above, sensing that Astrid had been roused awake after just twenty minutes of sleep. My ma used to say some voodoo magic is within you, lets you know stuff we don't. Only the dead know these things. Come on, tell me, what are they saying? They're telling me that Mags is full of shit, Astrid said sleepily, getting a chuckle from her friend in return. Chocolate? Asked Mags, her thick olive-toned arm shooting out from the side of her bed, swinging a bar of ration chocolate in Astrid's direction. No, Mags, Astrid replied. Shouldn't you be eating something a bit healthier? You're 30 weeks pregnant, and this isn't the time for carelessness. Who cares? Mags said nonchalantly. It's all going to be over in a few days. Might as well let my little bubble of joy experience the wonders of chocolate before that. Astrid stared up at the underside of Mag's bed. Her fellow comrade had been taken over by fever right before the world was preparing to collapse on itself, before their eyes. That too for a child that would most probably never grow up. For the last two years, the Twelfth Legion had been preparing for Doomsday, the day the extraterrestrial pods woke up to their newly morphed atmosphere and took over whatever was left of Earth once and for all. They'd made their first appearance 50 years ago, in the year 2187, absorbing most of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and replacing it with methane. Today, the Earth stood hostile for all of a life, its surfaces dead and barren, while Astrid sat with the remnants of the human race 600 feet below the surface. She wondered what was going on above. Comrades! Shouted Dr. Jamil through the announcement speakers, startling Astrid and breaking her from her train of thought. To the mess hall in five. Around a thousand soldiers had gathered in the mess hall within a few minutes of Dr. Jamil's assembly call, all very anxious and jittery on what would be their last day below the surface. The mess hall was where they ate, discussed, collaborated, and planned. To describe it as a colossal would be an understatement. It was the largest hall in Tasselborough, the underground city they had built over the last five decades, enough to seat a couple thousand soldiers at any given time. In the last few years, Dr. Jamil had used this mess hall as a work haven, creating extensive battle strategies for Doomsday. Intricate, down to the finest details, complete with numerous backup plans that covered every possibility of mishap once the soldiers were released into the hostile environment above. 
As you know, comrades, Dr. Jamil said, Tomorrow is the first day, the very beginning of your lives. Tomorrow we create a new day zero. Let us go over our plans briefly to avoid any last minute confusions. Astrid looked at the doctor's eyes that were filled with deep sorrow, probably a remnant of grief that he had experienced after his wife and two kids were killed a couple of days after day zero. Yet in his eyes glimmered a ray of hope that had stayed unextinguished all this time. Now that the countdown to these pods releasing the radiodromes was finally coming to an end, he felt a bittersweet satisfaction at these last moments. Helmet! He called out. Describe to me what the pods are and how you would destroy them upon opening. Helmet stood up. The short, scrawny boy's biggest advantage was that he didn't seem like a threat. Yet Astrid had seen him and fought with him multiple times. He was light fast and very nimble, and had subsequently caused a lot of damage to many of the radiodromes before they went into hibernation. Sir, each pod is a breeding capsule for the radiodromes. They've been known to drag fresh human bodies fallen in battle to the pods. Word says it's to source their nutrition while they're in the pods and create more radiodromes from the tissue material, but we aren't sure yet. The outer layer of the pods are made of a pure organic carbon skeleton material that is impenetrable. Thus, the only surefire way to destroy one is to drop a grenade into it when it's open. Dr. Jamil looked satisfied, motioning to Helmet to sit down with his hand. Very well. Now, Jean will tell us what Operation Purgatory will look like. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Juan stood up, straightening his shoulders. Ask the leader of the 14th Legion. I will lead my soldiers to the roundabout at the Joan of Arc, where lies a great sack of pods lined up high against the monument. We will reach there at 9 a.m., three hours before the pods split open and douse the pods in a mixture of highly flammable gasoline and diesel. As soon as the pods split open, we light them ablaze. Any remaining survivors from within the pods will be shot down by our war machine, Berserk. Good job, John Carlos. The leader of the 14th Legion sat back in his chair, but he didn't seem too happy with the compliment he'd just received from his mentor. Instead, a white paper hue decorated his lips, a sign Astrid recognized as anxiety. She could understand. They'd all live their lives down here in the city of Bunkers. And while they obviously wanted to reclaim the Earth for human rehabilitation, a lot of them knew they wouldn't survive long enough to see it happen. Dr. Jamil pointed towards the 12th Legion next, at Rave specifically. Rave Lightfoot? What can you tell us about the Operation Starlight? Rave responded in a series of grunts in sign language. Uh, uh, uh to be awarded by a wave of delighted applause. While he was just a disabled teen with an intense passion about his homeland, Astrid absolutely despised him for some reason. As a baby, he was found in the decaying forest not far from the bunkers, burned up and injured brutally, right at the brink of death. He couldn't speak, couldn't walk without leg braces, and the melted skin on his face had covered most of his left eye and ear which the very trained medical team at Tasselborough had surgically fixed and replaced with implants. Even though he was in no shape to fight, he always insisted his fate was written this way, and although Astrid hated to admit it, he was particularly good at devising foolproof plans. Astrid didn't hate him because he was disabled. That was, in retrospect, one of the few things that she respected about him. The fact was that whenever he was nearby, the voices in Astrid's head exploded like a hydrogen bomb, ranging from whispers of danger when he was a couple hundred meters away, to full-blown screams of agony when he was grunting directly to her. Astrid could never understand what was wrong with him or herself, but she had to just learn to avoid him, which was quite difficult to do since they were in the same legion. Young soldiers of Earth! Tomorrow is a new day zero. Tomorrow, you fight for all of us. You will fight for those who are afraid for their future. 
for their children, for their lives. You will cleanse the earth from these atrocities once and for all. Prayers. The thing Jamil didn't tell them about Doomsday is how they'd wake up feeling different, knowing that death was almost certainly barreling towards them like a hungry hound. Astrid woke up the same exact way, welcomed by the screaming voices in her head as well. She knew this would happen, and had taken melatonin pills beforehand to fall asleep faster. Nonetheless, her slumber had been plagued by vivid nightmares that spoke to her of death and decay, and their whispers remained when her eyes opened. Comrades! Dr. Jamil shouted through the intercom. Avenge our race! Free planet Earth from this plague! Fear no being that comes in your way! Astrid fidgeted around her mask and armor, feeling the air whooshing around them through the vibrations of the aluminum plane as it carried the 12th Legion to Ground Zero. The Kevlar suit she wore was lightweight, bulletproof, and a good barrier against the toxic methane outside, which wouldn't kill a human instantly, but would leave some nasty side effects once they were done. Ground Zero was a battered wasteland, right out of a fictional horror. The sight they saw was absolutely terrifying, as the plane descended through the scorching air. The Valley of Namsa, a rocky, stony desert land, was filled with thousands of pods, all shielded with sand and mud three quarters of their lengths through. Above each cluster of pods hovered what Astrid immediately recognized as the Betatrons, intricate androids evident of advanced extraterrestrial engineering that the scientists at Tasselborough had yet to identify and replicate. Each Betatron periodically emitted a blasting sound at a known radio frequency, which was their way of communicating with and analyzing the developing radiodromes within the pods. From afar, they looked like giant electronic octopi, using their giant suction tubes to get a grip of the ground as they skimmed over the pods, ripening the radiodromes inside. Inside the body of each Betatron lay their motherboard, a small rectangular circuit, which, upon destruction, deactivated the entire machine. However, if it was one thing Astrid truly feared, it was an Alphatron. These androids were like octopi, except that they were highly intelligent and crawled through the wasteland at terrifying speeds, killing everything in their path. They had the habit of doing a death roar before killing their opponents, a deathly noise, powerful enough to warp the time and space around their kill making them one of the biggest reasons they were able to conquer Earth on Day Zero. Odin, the Slayer, and Bjorn, the Crusher, knelt down next to either side of Astrid as the Twelfth Legion observed the Valley of Namsa, cautiously preparing for Operation Stealth. The Nordic genes of the twins and their fondness for violence had brought them quite some popularity amongst the Legion, and though Astrid wouldn't admit it, she was quite fond of them too. Through their gas masks, they breathlessly motioned everyone to get closer. There are 43 Betatrons and 17 Alphatrons roaming down there. There are 120 of us here. Subleachian Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Take the UV Blaster and attack five of the Alphatrons that are shimming by the river. Remember to paralyze them with the UV before attacking. Don't get in the Death Roar zone and make sure you collect their motherboards. Sublegion Echo to November. Start destroying the Betatrons, but do so stealthily and silently. We don't want any chaos down there. Sublegion Oscar to Zulu. Spread the medical camp behind the rocks. Something tells me there will be quite some casualties. Astrid strapped her machetes and her grenades on her belt, securing her single cyanide capsule in a little pocket. She'd eaten two antipsychotics today to keep the voices in control, since there was no way she could afford another schizophrenic episode right in the middle of the battle. And thankfully, all she had to endure now were the slight whispers of fear whenever she got too close to a Tron or a Rave. The only voices she wanted to hear today would be from the earpiece she wore, since communicating with allies whilst wearing the gas mask was quite tedious. Against her chest, she held her gun, a silent yet deadly weapon, quick and damaging enough to kill a radiodrome within seconds. She felt a hand on her shoulder and turned around to face her best friend, and former Sublegion Alpha member, Mags, who had been shifted to Sublegion Oscar, post her 22-week gestation mark. Good luck, Astrid. 
Mag smiled sadly. Be a bad girl down there. Give me a good show. I'm watching. Astrid looked at the person closest she would come to calling a sister, and gave her a tight hug. Dr. Jamil had pleaded with Mags to stay within Tasselborough, but she had insisted upon fighting with Sublegion Alpha. After many days of debating, they had reached this arrangement of compromise. Astrid jogged with the four other members of Sublegion Alpha towards the empty radiodrome burrows, which they used to crawl down to the base of the valley without being seen. Sublegion Alpha, acknowledge this message and confirm your presence. Dr. Jamil said through the earpiece, all the way from the control room in Tasselborough, where everything was being monitored tightly. Present. Odin and Bjorn replied. Here. Astrid replied. Present. Helmut said. Ah. Rave grunted. Good. Dr. Jamil said. Proceed cautiously. My radar has detected three Alphatrons in your vicinity, the nearest one being a couple hundred meters away. Let's go. Odin said through the earpiece. The Alphatron was a lot more terrifying now that they were right in its danger zone. It was indeed a large creature. Astrid noticed, its tentacles each being at least 20 meters long. It was crawling slowly up a cliffside, which the Nordic brothers silently dragged the UV blaster out into the open, its panel facing the otherworldly entity. The brothers signaled to Astrid and Helmut that the machine was ready to be fired. Hey, asshole! Helmut shouted. The Alphatron shifted its head towards their group, faster than they could process. It scurried down the side of the cliff at a terrifying speed, barreling towards them with the help of its razor-lined tentacles, its mouth half open in preparation of the death roar. It slowed down within a hundred meters of the group, producing eerie chirping sounds, which Astrid recognized as the Alphatron using echolocation to analyze the subjects before itself. You will never conquer the ones without humanity. Look at his face. It is covered in the blood of your kin. Run. Do not trust the betrayer amongst you. He can look through you, and you will not be able to avenge us. Shut up, Astrid whispered firmly, tapping her left temple. Not now. I need to focus. Bjorn quickly flipped the UV blaster on, suspending the creature mid-roar. Its mouth was open, but no sound came out. It had been held in a deadly trance. As if right on cue, Helmut jumped down from the ledge he'd been standing and swiftly climbed the Tron's back, right up to the latch where the motherboard lay. He unsheathed his dagger from his belt and broke open the latch pulling out a greasy black circuit board that smelled like decaying bodies and foul oil. Immediately, the buzzing that came from deep within the Alphatron's body ceased, and the Tron dropped dead on the floor. One Alphatron down, northeast to the base camp, Astrid said excitedly into the earpiece. They'd taken down this one within minutes, and it would be just a few more hours before they'd have cleansed the entire valley of these foul entities. But fate had been cruel, and would prove to be cruel today, too. Within the space of 15 minutes, multiple things happened, changing the dynamic of battle completely. Initiated by a sharp whirring sound echoing through the air, as all the battalions heard a frantic message. Mayday! Mayday! This is Captain Arthur speaking from the Namasir, carrying the 6th and 8th legions of the force to Pym. We've been hit by a laser beam from a rogue Betatron, both our engines have been compromised. I'm making an emergency landing in the Valley of Namsa. May the Lord have mercy on us. As Sublegion Alpha looked into the sky atop the battlefield, they spotted the Nomasir, leaving behind a trail of thick black smoke in the sky as it lowered its descent into the valley. Captain Arthur must have gotten a deadly yet supposedly brilliant last minute idea, they realized as the plane shot towards the biggest Betatron hanging above the valley, its tentacle-like suction devices moving slowly and unprepared across the ground. As the 6th and 8th Legion collided to their deaths, a brilliant mushroom of light illuminated the entire valley blindingly, sending off fiery blobs all across the sky. 
The massive explosion produced a boom so loud that Astrid was deaf for a good few minutes before the tinnitus began to subside. Suddenly, a deafening groan shook the earth, vibrating everything very similar to how an earthquake would. See, Captain Arthur's brave landing in the Valley of Namsa, no matter how good in taste the sacrifice was made, had brought upon them all severely deadly consequences. The explosion had been loud enough to disturb the radio frequencies which the Trons used to communicate with the pods, which were now receiving a very new and very dangerous signal. <coughs> Damn it, thought Astrid, frantically tapping her forehead. They will sniff out the stench of your fear that emanates from your flesh. You better warn the others too. Blood will flow thick and heavy like a monsoon rain. Tonight is a slaughter, and this valley will entomb your bones forever. But your flesh, of course, will be draped on the bodies of the devil's spawn. Aborting Operation Stealth! I repeat, aborting Operation Stealth! Subletion Alpha is approaching the base camp. I request all the subletions to step back and report all casualties to Dr. Jamel. Immediately! Odin shouted into his mouthpiece. The screaming in Astrid's ear got worse as she felt the ground rumble, as if something was rushing towards them. It was perplexing, and no plan of Dr. Jamil's had prepared them for this. Oh god, Astrid said. It's the Alphatrons. They're coming here. We need to leave. Where is Rave? Where is Rave? Bjorn screamed into his mouthpiece, looking frantically around him. He was standing next to the Alphatron a few moments ago! Helmut screamed back. We need to leave, man! I'm going! The Alphas are almost at our heels, and we have only one UV blaster! We cannot take them all down at once! Astrid! Mag's voice echoed through the airpace out of nowhere, startling the running soldiers. Astrid, you need to listen to me! Max lay against the cliff wall, a few feet above them on a jutting rock, and the sight of her made Astrid's stomach turn. As the rest of Sublegion Alpha fled the scene, she ran in the opposite direction, climbing the burrow holes to reach her friend as the sun went down. Soon enough, Astrid realized something awful had happened. Mag's clothes had been tattered to shreds, and a single shard of razor-sharp obsidian stuck out of her abdomen. Decorated by a pool of blood, in her hands lay a bundle of cloth, which Astrid unwrapped and screamed. Max, she cried. What has happened? Come on, take my arm. Let's go up to the med base. Please, Max, open your eyes. Shut up and listen carefully. Max repeated woozily, at the brink of sleep. It's Rave. I don't know why he did this or what he's up to, but there have been a bunch of silent assassinations at camp. I found him poisoning the groundwater we had purified, so I confronted him, and that son of a bitch stabbed me. Totally didn't see that coming. I had to warn you. I can't go back up there. I don't have the strength to. Hot tears ran down Astrid's face, as steam collected in her gas mask. Hands shivering, Max handed Astrid over the bundle of cloth, in which lay a tiny, lifeless body. I named him Hector Jr., after his daddy. My boy will finally have both his parents with him. Max said, brown eyes focusing on a distance and becoming glassier by the second. As Astrid wept beside her with Hector Jr. cradled in her arms. And just like that, Max was gone forever. Fate was cruel enough not to give Astrid the time to mourn her friend. As shortly after Mags departed, the vibrations had gotten louder and were coming towards them from below, as Astrid realized the Alphatrons had begun their ascent on the cliff. That too, in the dark. She couldn't leave Mags' body and her baby like this in the open, where the radiodromes would use their tissue to replicate an organic body. So she spent the next few minutes tediously dragging Mags' body into the entrance of an abandoned nearby burrow. Through the tears, she removed her friend's mask to see her gentle face one last time. Propping Hector Jr. in her arms, 
Astrid kissed her friend goodbye as the wave of the unbeknownst Alphatrons outside rumbled past them. The group sat silently on the clifftop, cheering quietly for the victory of the 14th Legion at the Joan of Arc. The survivors of the first half sat under the shade of a huge, dead tree atop the cliff, some greasy and bloody, others in considerably better shape. Rave Lightfoot had the audacity to sit with the other survivors on top of a rock, sitting in the middle of the base camp, seemingly consoling one of the injured soldiers by patting them on their back as they drank water from a metal canister. Rave! Astrid thundered towards the group, her mind thirsty for blood and her hands itching for a kill. He heard her enraged voice call out his name, yet he could not have imagined why she'd do that. He had watched a stabbed mags tumble down the side of the cliff with his own eyes, an event to which there was no witnesses save himself. Thus he could not have imagined that his entire plan had been ruined by one formerly pregnant female. Astrid pulled off Rave's gas mask and tossed it aside, swiping her dagger across Rave's face and slicing open a huge, gaping slit right across his mutilated features. He put his hands on his wound in shock as blood poured down his chin and dripped into the dead ground. <gasps> a collective gasp rose from the group as people processed what Astrid had done. Tell them how you killed Max! You traitor! Astrid screamed, hot tears of rage welling in her eyes. Tell them how you stabbed her ruthlessly! Rafe stared at her in disbelief, shock at the notion that his treacherous truth had been unveiled. He initiated a series of grunts and motioned to Odin in sign language, uh, uh. but was stopped as the latter's hand grasped his throat. What's she saying? Rave? Odin asked quietly. He's also poisoned some of the groundwater, and I bet it was you who sabotaged the Nomisir too, to make it an easier target for the Betatron. As expected, Rave had no explanation for that. He shrugged off Odin's hand and slowly backed away from the group motioning in sign language rapidly. I've never been one of you, and neither did you all fully accept me as your own. He motioned. Tron fluid has flowed through my blood since the very beginning, enabling me to communicate with my kin using the very same radio frequency they use. Sorry, but we know all your plans. We've known you were coming here since the very beginning, and that is why I insisted upon being in this legion, despite my disabilities. This landscape does not belong to you anymore. We will conquer it just like you humans conquered it from the rest of the animal kingdom in the past. I am insignificant, and I am done here. With that last sign, Rafe unveiled a cyanide pill from his belt, preparing to pop it in his mouth, only to be cut short when a high kick from one of the 10th Legion's girls knocked it out of his hands. Bind him up, Bjorn screamed, as Rafe broke into a weak sprint with which half a dozen soldiers caught up to, easily. Helmut and a few others quickly wrapped him up in a makeshift straitjacket within minutes and pushed him toward the ground. We go back to war within a few hours. The pods have ripened up completely and will be opening soon. We initiate Operation Starlight as soon as the pods first start opening. Remember to step away from the blaze as soon as you see it appear. Rave will be at the front of our mission, and his job is to let us know if any Trons are in the vicinity or not. If he's uneaten, we'll know they aren't there. If he's in, well, that's pretty clear too. As the sun came up, Astrid looked at the Valley of Namsa, the pods that were shaking violently, ready to open and unleash the horror within. Before Day Zero, she imagined couples coming here for romantic picnics, something she herself would never experience. Perhaps after today, many eons into the future, her descendants would come here one day to enjoy the land that rightfully belonged to them. The valley was now lit ablaze as the 12th Legion doused gasoline onto pods and released flares onto them. The entire valley seemed to be collapsing its floor sinking deeper and deeper, until it looked like the mouth of a fiery volcano, ready to blast the onlookers with its fire any time. Astrid looked down through her gas mask onto the craters of hell. She knew death was certain. 
but they weren't going to die on their knees, raising a battle cry into the air that was now hostile to them. Machetes clutched in each hand. Astrid and the last few humans jumped into the crater as the pods shook open, determined to give the walking radiodromes the last good morning of their lives. As they reached the base, Astrid saw the newly designed radiodromes coming out of their slimy pods, and the hair on the back of her neck stood up. Their bodies were a tangled mass of flesh and blood, and it looked like the glimpse of a half-rotted human face stuck to the torso of a radiodrome for Astrid to release in horror. That this is why the Trons and previous generations of radiodromes had a habit of dragging the bodies of their fallen foes into their burrows to partially digest and remold them. She started to gun down the screeching radiodromes, the fire upon them doing half of the damage too. This is for you, Mags! Astrid screamed as a radiodrome's inside splattered across the ground after encountering a bullet from her gun. Soon her magazines had emptied completely. All around her, bodies fell. She saw Helmut looking for her from a mid-cliff ledge, only to realize that he was dead and staring into nothingness. The Nordic twins charged right into a group of shrieking radiodromes with a berserk machine creating a blast of energy as the radio drama fell. Yet, in no time, more powered up upon the twins after sensing the disturbance. And soon, Astrid realized that there was no way the twins could have survived the pack of hungry entities crawling into their bodies like that. She climbed the ledge upon which Helmut rested to retrieve his fully loaded weapon as a few remaining paramedics watched the scene below in horror head filled with rage, Astrid shot at the mass of entangled flesh below, with complete focus and aim. Dr. Jamil! She cried into the mouthpiece, which she hoped was still working. We need reinforcements. This is Astrid from the 12th Legion. We are stranded in the Valley of Namsa. It is highly likely that we will not make it. The silence on the other end was too loud, but Astrid was delighted when a few moments later, She heard the rumble of aircrafts at a distance, speeding towards them. Yet, she knew they wouldn't make it in time. Slowly, as the rest of her legion perished below her, she realized the radiodromes had turned their attention to the clifftop, where the untrained paramedics scuttled around in panic. Astrid removed her gas mask and pulled the pins from all six of her grenades. She jumped from the ledge, eyes closed, free. For the first time in her life, unpinned grenades still strapped to her belt as she soared above the cliff and ultimately down into the screeching radiodromes that eagerly awaited her fall. All the voices in her head woke up together, quite calming and relaxing, for the first time ever. We welcome you to Valhalla, Fallen Martyr. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's Kira Rhodes. Thanks to all the VAs who helped with the production of this video. And thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Craving for another scary story? Click that video on your screen. Until next time everyone, and remember, stay cosmic.